and colleagues to Radcliffe Day 2017. As many of you know, if you were across the street with us, I'm Liz Cohen. I'm Dean of the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard. And it is a pleasure to have you all here with us under this big tent. Years ago, the, it, um, the size of this tent was aspirational. We imagined that one day it would be absolutely filled with Radcliffe and Harvard graduates, institute fellows, university friends, and participants in our many programs. Today, we don't have to imagine it. Attendance here at Radcliffe Yard has doubled in just the past five years, and we are joined by a global online audience as well. I am especially pleased to welcome Drew Gilpin Faust, Harvard President and Founding Dean of the Radcliffe Institute. <laughs> Provost Alan Garber, numerous deans and other university leaders, and Bill Lee, Senior Fellow of the Harvard Corporation. <laughs> along with many other members of, our, of Harvard's governing boards. A warm welcome to the Harvard Alumni Association, the Radcliffe Dean's Advisory Council, the Schlesinger Library Council, the Radcliffe Associates Program, the Anne Radcliffe Society, as well as past members of the Radcliffe College Board of Trustees and Alumni Association. And we are thrilled to have the Honorable Maura Healy joining us as well. <laughs> Just in case you didn't know, she is the Attorney General of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, a member of the class of 1992, <laughs> and Chief Marshal of yesterday's commencement ceremonies. And of course, a special welcome to Radcliffe medalist Judy Woodruff, our afternoon speakers. Our afternoon speakers, Walter Isaacson and Michelle Norris, and all of the participants in this morning's excellent discussion. I am also delighted to welcome back everyone who is here to attend a college reunion, including the reunion classes of 1942 and 47, 52 and 57, 62 and 67, 72 and 77, 82 and 87, 92 and 97, 2002, 2007, 2012, and we have some newest graduates in the class of 2017. In addition, we welcome Bunting Fellows, Radcliffe Fellows, and our Radcliffe Research Partners, who are undergraduates who work closely with our fellows on their research. Please join me in congratulating the members of the earliest class represented here today, the great class of 1941. When so many of us are gathered together, our thoughts turn to members of our Radcliffe community who are no longer with us. This year, we experienced the loss of Mary Maples Dunn, who directed the Schlesinger Library and then led Radcliffe as interim head while Radcliffe College made the transition to the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. We also lost Susan Story Lyman, who served as chair of the Board of Trustees, among many other roles in her decades of service to Radcliffe College. For them and for the many others who are missed and in our thoughts today, please join me in a moment of silence. The Radcliffe Institute is devoted to the pursuit of new knowledge, wherever it may be found by whomever is seeking it, whether fellows, students, faculty, or public audiences. That new idea might lie in medieval history, 
or in the observation of a black hole. It might be found in the pages of a diary at the Schlesinger Library or on the walls of the Johnson Kulakunda's Family Art Gallery. We believe as an institute for advanced study that it is our responsibility to be both timely and timeless and that our support of inquiry is even more necessary in tumultuous times. You can see this conviction in Radcliffe's offerings this past year, from our current exhibition about the history of Title IX, to our science symposium on the impact of climate change on the world's oceans, to our conference on universities and slavery. In the year ahead, we will launch a major programming initiative on citizenship, celebrate the Schlesinger Library's 75th anniversary, and welcome a fellowship class that includes a former UN ambassador, a Turing award-winning scientist, and a Pulitzer Prize-winning novelist. I hope that many of you will join us next fall for an exciting calendar of events. In just the first few months, we will mount a panel on the present and future of Boston's art museums, a lecture by physicist Brian Greene, a day-long science symposium on epidemics, and much, much more. You can get details at our website. Radcliffe is a very busy, dynamic place where all that we do is made possible by support from so many of you here today. In fact, we have set a new record. I am thrilled to announce that the Radcliffe campaign has just surpassed its $70 million goal. We have already received over 20,000 gifts, attracted more than 1,000 first-time donors, and diversified our support base. And fortunately, we still have a year to go before the campaign ends. Please join me in expressing appreciation to members of our Dean's Advisory Council and Schlesinger Library Council, and to Sid Knoffel and Susan Wallach for their extraordinary leadership as campaign co-chairs. Will those members please stand? We're asking the, that our council members please to stand. I cannot possibly cover here every accomplishment made, made possible by the campaign, but I'll just share a few highlights. We have built up a robust public programming wing of the Institute. You experienced some of that this morning. What we call academic ventures as our our wing to complement the Schlesinger Library and the fellowship program as the three pillars of the Radcliffe Institute. We have expanded the Schlesinger's undergraduate teaching activities. We have established directorships, fellowships, and professorships. We have launched a major campus renewal project. We have initiated a university-wide student public art competition and created flexible funds for the sciences, the arts, the library, and much more. I am absolutely delighted with our progress, but we are not done yet. The campaign concludes in June of 2018, and we will continue to, pers to pursue our aspirations as Harvard's Institute for Advanced Study and to increase our impact in the world. Going forward, we will focus our energies on raising funds for unmet campaign priorities. We aim to fully endow the fellowship program to provide our 50 talented fellows a year with the highest quality of experience, regardless of their personal resources. We intend to diversify the Schlesinger Library's collections to broaden and deepen the history of American women that library researchers are able to write today and tomorrow. We will grow the exploratory and advanced seminars program run by Academic Ventures to meet increasing demand from Harvard faculty and Radcliffe Fellows who wish to pursue collaborative research and explore even more deeply in their areas of expertise. 
And we plan to renovate Radcliffe's buildings to provide state-of-the-art facilities to make possible the highest level of scholarly and artistic work and public events. It is fitting that today, Radcliffe Day 2017, we are celebrating this campaign success and our continued ambitions with all of you. Thank you for helping us to reach this milestone and for your continued enthusiasm for the Radcliffe Institute. The Radcliffe campaign has reached one kind of milestone, but our society has been living through a pivotal time of a different sort. In recent years, the American media has undergone dramatic shifts, and all of us here have experienced some elements of that transition. To get our news, we used to snap open a newspaper or tune the radio dial. Now, we might turn on a television or increasingly swipe a screen for a headline. Unlike some evolutions, in this case, the new hasn't eclipsed the old. These various forms of media coexist together. With all the options, it turns out that Americans, on a weekly basis, now follow the news most on television, followed by their computers and other electronic devices, then radio, and then finally print publications. I was going to express condolences to the print journalists in the room, but after hearing Jonah remind us that it all comes down to, to print, I, I feel better. In other words, television is number one when it comes to shaping what we know, when we know it, and whom we trust. It is especially important in this context to recognize that it was only four years ago that the United States gained its first all-female TV news team when Gwen Ifill and Judy Woodruff were named co-anchors of the PBS NewsHour. In covering the news, they made the news. Judy and Gwen weren't just a stellar team of journalists with decades of combined experience on camera and in print. They became part of the history of American journalism. The importance of an all-woman news team is perhaps best summed up in Gwen's own words. She said, and I quote her, when I was a little girl watching programs like this, because that's the kind of nerdy family we were, I would look up and not see anyone who looked like me in any way. No women, no people of color. I'm very keen about the fact that a little girl now watching the news, when they see me and Judy sitting side by side, it will occur to them that that's perfectly normal, that it won't seem like any big breakthrough at all. Well, maybe someday a team like Judy and Gwen won't seem like a major change. But we who have been watching the news longer know that we actually have witnessed two big breakthroughs, Judy's and Gwen's. Neither had an easy start in journalism. They experienced resistance and rejection. Like a certain current Massachusetts senator, they were warned, they were given explanations. Nevertheless, they persisted. Judy is a proud graduate of Duke, where she was active, not surprisingly, in publications, the student union, and student government. She followed her interest in politics to an internship in Washington, where her enthusiasm collided with warnings against women pursuing political careers. So she decided instead to cover politics and applied for jobs at local television stations back home in Atlanta. One station turned her down because, and I quote, we already have a woman reporter. She could, however, be a secretary. Judy remained undeterred. She worked her way up by reporting on stories across Georgia, including covering Jimmy Carter's presidential campaign. She served as a White House correspondent, the anchor of a PBS documentary series, and a senior correspondent at CNN. 
Longtime NewsHour colleague Jim Lair offered an insight into Judy's success when he said, no matter how hard everyone else was working, Judy was working harder. Her young colleagues today still agree. In a recent New York Times profile, a 27-year-old politics producer said about Judy, we all struggle just to keep up with her. She's just such a workhorse. And she has worked everywhere. We saw her reporting in Washington just after the assassination attempt on President Reagan, from outside the Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City, on the ground in Chechnya, and in Chicago on the night President Obama was first elected. Wherever she is, Judy delivers first-rate reporting and smart, incisive interviews. Because she asks better questions, she gets better answers. When Susan Rice, President Obama's White House National Security Advisor, was ready to give her first interview after leaving office, it was with Judy. When Vice President Mike Pence gave his first television interview after taking office, it was with Judy. Now, there may not be much else that Mike Pence and Susan Rice agree on, but they both trust Judy Woodruff to communicate their views to the American public. Judy has also won the trust of the many journalists whose careers she has helped launch and support as a founding member, founding co-chair of the International Women's Media Foundation. The reason why so many professionals admire Judy is the same reason viewers do and why we are honoring her today. We respect her intelligence and we rely on her integrity. Gwen's career, like Judy's, began with some bumps. Gwen was interning at the Boston Herald at the height of the Boston busing crisis of the 1970s when she found a threatening racist note on her desk. Given that climate, it is no surprise that she was initially reluctant to accept a job offer from the Herald upon her graduation from Simmons College a year later. But she did need a job, so she returned to the Herald after all. Years later, she said about that decision, and I quote, I knew if I got my foot in the door, I could do it. And Gwen did far more than get her foot in the door. She went on to report for the Baltimore Sun, the Washington Post, and the New York Times as a White House correspondent, and then to NBC television. Even as the news cycle sped up, Gwen never stopped being respected as an impeccable writer, a sharp analyst, and a caring colleague. When Gwen became the moderator of the PBS program Washington Week in Review in 1999, she also became the first black woman to host a national political talk show on television. Along with her professional expertise, she brought her dinner table experiences growing up as one of six children in a family where every evening's conversation drew on knowledge of current events and honed sharp, critical thinking. Holding her own among her siblings trained her to set high standards for the level of discourse and to manage her guests masterfully. With Gwen running the show, there were disagreements, but tough exchanges were not disagreeable. Over the decades, millions of Americans came to rely on the information Gwen provided and the discussions she led. That trust was born from one of Gwen's cardinal rules, no predictions. Guests on Washington Week who trafficked in theories or speculation were not invited back. She kept her focus and ours on what was known, how we knew it, and why it mattered. When we think about Gwen and Judy as individuals, we find insight, persistence, achievement, and personal and professional integrity. Both were recognized for those qualities when assigned to moderate presidential and vice presidential debates, interview world leaders, and report on the most important stories of the day. But what we saw when they came together as co-anchors of PBS NewsHour was capability and chemistry at the highest levels. 
and the connection that Gwen and Judy shared extended to the entire NewsHour family of correspondents and commentators, so much so that we as audience members felt a part of it as well. We are pleased to be joined here today by some of the many journalists that Gwen and Judy have inspired and championed over the years as mentors and colleagues, as well as with their friends and family. It is hard to imagine anyone better suited to converse with Judy than Walter Isaacson. His omniferous intellect has led to an impressive journalism career, leadership of the Aspen Institute, and the award-winning biographies of leading figures from the 18th through the 21st centuries, including Benjamin Franklin, Albert Einstein, and Steve Jobs. Who better to help us examine the state of journalism at present who better to shed light on the contributions of our honorees? And who better, if it's not too much to ask Walter, to give us some hope for the future? Please join me in welcoming Wal Walter Isaacson and Judy Woodruff to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Liz. <clears throat> Congratulations, Judy. This is a huge honor, and I cannot think of anybody who deserves this honor or to share it with the memory of Gwen than you. So Thank congratulations. You. Thank you. I am humble. Thank you. <laughs> Our panel this morning spent a lot of time talking about truth in a place where Veritas is revered how we've lost that as the true north of all journalism in our political discourse. One of the things that you and Gwen shared so much was an intellectual honesty. I mean, there are very few people we could look at and say, if they are saying it, they believe it to be true. Tell us about that quality in Gwen and how that helped shape your journalism. Well, first of all, I'm just in incredibly honored to be here. Uh, this is just a, uh, a moment. I know Gwen is looking down on all of us right now. Uh, so sorry that she can't be here, but thrilled that she's represented by her amazing mentees and her close friends who we're going to hear from a little bit later. And Walter, you knew Gwen very well, so you know as I do, she would be, uh, she really wanted to be here today. So I think of, of her as sitting right next to me. <laughs> She's certainly um, smiling with that amazing smile she, down upon her. She is. What, how, how to begin about Gwen? Um, she represented, and you all know what an incredible journalist she was. The thing was, when we came together at the News Hour, I, she had been there since 1999. I came back uh, to the News Hour in 2007, and we knew each other. We were friendly, oh. but we hadn't been colleagues. And I think I was thinking about this a lot last night. Um, we probably regarded each other a little carefully in the beginning. We're both competitive. We both have been doing, we've had heads down for years and years. And so it took a few months, maybe a year or so, for us to be really comfortable with each other uh, in the newsroom. But once we got to know each other, once we knew that we both believed in the same things, and Walter, this comes to your question, and once I saw up close all the things that I had heard about Gwen, knew about Gwen, um, I recognized that I was in the presence of somebody who was you know, emblematic of the kind of journalism that I believe in that should be the, the journalism that persists. She was absolutely relentless in pursuit of facts. She was, she was bold in the way she approached people, uh, fearless in the way she talked about the kind of stories we were going to do. I mean, I'll just tell you, in a morning meeting, we were discussing what to put on the news hour that night. We might go around the table, and everybody would chime in, this is a great idea, that's a great idea, and Gwen would be the one to say, you know, that's really a terrible idea. <laughs> uh, and here's why, and she would go on and explain it. And, and so it was that quality of Gwen. It was getting right to the heart of the matter. And it was always thinking of everybody else in the room. She was always the one who was looking to the younger staff, to the, to the desk assistant who had just come on our team and was there and was quiet and holding back. Gwen would be the first one to know that, that young man or young woman's name, to, to pull them out 
and to recognize that her role, that our role, eventually, as we were named anchors, was to, and managing editors, was to, was to model for them the, what's important about journalism. Tell me about y'all being named managing editors. I mean, Jim Lehrer decides to step down. Did this right. come as a surprise that they were going to pull the two of you together? Well, when Jim first stepped down, uh, we had a rotating set of anchors there because we had a, a, an amazing team of correspondents. All of you who watch the news hour know this. Uh, but <laughs> Margaret Warner, uh, Jeffrey Brown, Ray Suarez was with us at the time. And of course, we have some incredible journalists who've joined us since then. But in the beginning, we, there was a rotation system. And then in 2013, the decision was made to, uh, to name Gwen and me co-anchors. You know, we had already worked together the year before, co-anchoring and sitting at the conventions, the Democratic and Republican conventions in 2012. We had anchored election night together. We had, were working very closely together at that time. And Walter, what I'll tell you was when, when we were named and when it was clear that this was really going to happen, you know, we had a long private talk together, and we decided that what was the most important thing of all was that not only, I mean, I already knew what an incredible journalist Gwen is, I know what, an, what a friend she was to me and to so many others, but we, more than anything, we knew that we had each other's backs. I mean, I knew if I messed up on the air, said something, she was gonna be the one to gently correct it. She didn't make mistakes, so. <laughs> I didn't have to worry about doing that, but, but Quite, quite seriously, we had each other's backs. Wait, wait, tell me more about that conversation. I mean, this is a real physical, like a dinner or something, and what did you all say? Well, it was actually, you know, it was yeah. a number of dinners yeah. and lunches and conversations that just went on for days and days. But this was, this was after we knew we were taking, taking over the show. And we, what Gwen always said to me, and I want to say this again because I think it came up in the, in the panel of, uh, earlier this morning. We view our role at the news hour as the custodians of something that's been handed to us. What Robin McNeil and Jim Lehrer started in 1975 after the Watergate hearings, they came together to create the McNeil Lehrer Report. The kind of journalism they believe in is the kind of journalism we believe in. Journalism that is about informing and when we can, analyzing and clarifying and bringing light and not heat. And I know that's become a cliche, you hear it all the time. But we really do mean it, and we really do mean that we're not here to make it, to have a noisy argument. It's got to remain civil, but it has to also remain vital. People have to feel when they're watching, when they're engaging in whatever we're doing, whether it's online or even in social media, that we're doing something that they understand matters to them. So Gwen and I were committed to that, and that we were really just the temporary custodians of the news hour. We want the news hour to be passed on. To the, I think Jonah Goldberg said this uh, earlier, we want the journalism we do to be passed on to the next generation and the next one. And so whatever we do right now, we knew, uh, was, gonna, was gonna set an example for the young people around Well, us. that's what it is to be part of an institution, is to realize it's larger than just yourself. And one of the things you brought to it, I know we're celebrating Gwen, but very much you personally brought to it too, was that deeply earnest Honesty, And I remember, you know, when we were young and in our salad days and you were covering Jimmy Carter and then you and Al and I doing Reagan, there was just no question of having a private or secret agenda. How do you bring that into a world today? With well, I mean, we, this, again, this came out on the panel this morning and I think everybody was there. No politician <laughs> wants to bring bad news. No politician wants to share mm -hmm. the worst things that are going on in his or her life or his or her career or whatever uh, battle he or she is engaged in. So you don't expect you go to a politician and they're gonna bare their soul. You go into covering politics understanding that they wanna give you, they're always gonna wanna give you the best side. Having said that, you, you do expect them to level with you at, at ground level, that they're not gonna mislead you about the fundamentals of what they believe in. And, and that is what I think we wanna preserve in this country. That, has that, that changed? Well, I think in, in some respects it has, because I think today, um, I think because of this crazy, complicated media environment we're in, and you know, we can talk about this, I think it's easier for politicians to, to skirt around uh, what, it, what is the core that they're working on, of what, what is the core of their belief. And when they do that, 
you know, they don't, they don't necessarily want to come clean. They don't, you know, it may not, they don't feel it's in their interest uh, to, be, uh, to be straight. And, but we as reporters have to constantly ask those questions. But one of the things about the media landscape is that the balkanization of it has led to so much more opinions, but now, as we heard this morning, also different sets of facts. You know, how do we fight against that? Well, first of all, there's a place for opinion journalism. Again, I'm going to quote Jonah Goldberg again. There is a place for opinion journalism in, in our great democratic society. We are all about debate and argument. That's what makes us the great <laughs> country that we are. But I came along with the old-fashioned kind of journalism uh, in which you have to base the, the, the opinion on, a, on an agreed set of facts. And yes, you can debate around the margins, but to say I'm going to ignore an entire set of uh, uh, you know, data that has been clearly uh, backed up and say we're not going to look at that, we're going to, we're going to go in another direction because it doesn't suit our argument, I don't think that serves us as a democracy. And do we have the right, I say we, I'm no, I'm a, it's been a while since I've been a journalist, the right to now say that's just a lie? Because we used to not say that. <laughs> You're right, we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty careful about calling something a lie because to me a lie gets at the motivation <clears throat> behind what somebody, I think we can comfortably say if we know what someone has said, is false. Mm -hmm. If we know demonstrably that this happened, that A happened, and the person said B happened, we can point that out. I mean, absolutely we can. We should. Calling someone a liar or saying that is a lie, you're ascribing a motive to them. I don't think we need to do that. I think our viewers, the people who follow us, follow any news organization, you're smart enough to know. If, if you know what happened, if you've seen it reported, if you've read enough about it, and if the politician or whomever you're talking to is telling it a completely different way, or the journalist, you see the difference. And it's, so it's self-evident. Uh, as those of you who are at the panel this morning know, we're, by quoting Jonah Goldberg a few times, we're trying to destroy his career by having him <laughs> favorably accepted in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and we're waiting for Breitbart to come down on him. But one of the things he also he said was that we totally missed it. That it wasn't just about Donald Trump, and it wasn't just that we didn't quite understand Donald Trump. That for the past 10 to 15 years, we have missed what's happening that's not on the coast. Oh, I think there's, a, there's an absolute uh, truth to that, Walter. I think um, for all the good things that have happened in the media, we've got more smart young people coming in. We are covering. Uh, uh, we've, got, we've got reporters today who've been to law school. They've been to graduate school. They are much, they're much more steeped in science or whatever it is, the subject is, the subject matter that they're covering. So we've got smarter reporters than we've ever had. We've got more sources of information. But I would also argue that we have climbed into our little uh, uh, well, comfortable well. places. Uh, and much of it, as we know, is right here on the East Coast, separated only by a few hours on the, uh, on the Acela. Uh, between Washington and New York and Boston, we're here, we're doing great work, but what about the rest of the country? I mean, it, you know, what about uh, places like Pennsylvania, like Michigan, like my home, my birth state of Oklahoma, like Colorado, New Mexico? where, yes, there's some journalism, but there isn't enough of the kind of journalism to, to really understand what people's lives are. So what and, are you doing at the news hour uh, to try to remedy this? Well, we're, we are doing everything we can to talk to people, to send <laughs> reporters out, to get a sense of America, whether the subject is health care, education, science, politics, <clears throat> to talk to Americans in all walks of life, no matter where they live. But you know what, Walter? It gets at the business model mm -hmm. of journalism. We are there. Everybody here knows newspapers have closed down by the hundreds and hundreds over the last decade, 15 years. We've lost tens of thousands of reporters. Uh, we don't have as many people out asking questions, doing the kind of deep, dirty, hard work document reporting that we need to understand this country. And without that, and without people getting out into these places, whether it's uh, Michigan, uh, Oregon, you name it, and, and talking, to again, to real people on the ground, understanding their lives, 
we, we can't reflect this country back to it. My, my view of what journalism is, is we should be holding a mirror up to the American people. We should be saying, here's where we're doing well, and here's where we need work. And here's what you need to know to be a good citizen, to make decisions about not just how you're going to vote, but how to think about the people uh, who are making decisions for you in Washington. And unless we are out there talking to those people, getting their view, hearing from them, uh, and frankly, respecting that view, uh, even when it differs from ours, mm -hmm. and giving it equal time or more time, then I don't think we're holding up, we're not doing our job holding up a mirror to this country. I think we've done a lot of things really well, but I also think we've got a lot of work to do when it comes to that mirror. And I mean that in every regard. It, it means, um, you know, we've done, we've done a much better job, I think, of including women mm -hmm. in the work that we do, of including uh, minorities, although goodness knows we've got so much more work to do there. But we also need to get out and cover people who live in rural areas and cover, uh, uh, you know, cover, cover the industries that we don't, we don't see on the East Coast. Uh, also, the uh, destruction of the business model for journalism. I mean, uh, EJ said it's the best and worst of times. It's in some ways the best of times for a lot of journalism, but the worst of times for a business model. That's decimated international reporting. Uh, how do you try to keep that uh, in the forefront? Well, what we've done, I can just tell you at the news hour, and I know other news organizations are committed to this. They've deployed correspondence. I mean, between the Associated Press the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, and so many other organizations that have just absolutely remained committed to covering the world despite the resource challenges that we all face. What we've had to do is work more and more in partnership. We have partnership with the Pulitzer Center, for example, for Pulitzer Center for Crisis Reporting, with other, uh, frankly, new organizations that have cropped up that are able to get correspondents, reporters, into countries uh, that we otherwise wouldn't be in. We had a reporter, for example, in South Sudan doing several pieces for us just a few days ago. We've had reporters uh, in Iraq and other places. We don't have the wherewithal on the news hour budget to go cover these places and cover them all the time. So we have to enter into these partnership agreements, and we're trying to do that all the time, to get people into, whether it's China, uh, Korea, Taiwan, I mean, there's so many parts of the planet that I think go uncovered, or it's insufficiently covered right now. What do you say to those who uh, say that the news hour and the mainstream press in general is just too elite, too aimed at a certain group, aging elite group? Uh, <laughs> I'm speaking to a tent full of the aging elite, so we're not necessarily against that. You're going to let him get away with that, <laughs> are you? Oh. <laughs> but, uh, you know, isn't there an elitism to some of uh, what you've just said that people don't want this, but we're going to still try to do it? Well, in terms of age, this is anecdotal, but last night as I'm waiting at the uh, Washington National Airport to fly to Boston, a couple of 20-somethings came up to me with their boyfriends and said, we never miss the news hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We watch it together. They <laughs> Good. We you know, we did selfies and I I expected them to say they down, you know, they listen to us on podcast or on their wrist, wristwatch. They said, "No, we sit in front of a television." Really? And watch. <laughs> uh, but but to get to your question, sure our audience skews older. I mean, those are the folks who grew up with Walter Cronkite, Huntley Brinkley, John Chancellor, who was a mentor of mine when I was at NBC, and others. Uh, and that's perfectly fine. But we also have to be madly figuring out, and we are, how to reach the younger generation. And that means being available wherever they are. And so without getting into all the, the nitty gritty of it, we are, we are uh, we, if you've checked out our webpage, mm -hmm. pbs.org slash news hour, you will see there are many, many more stories there that we have room, mm -hmm. than we possibly would have room to put on the program. But you know, again, Walter, your point about being elite, um, and, it, and it, I think it, it reflects back to what I said a moment ago. This is something we have to worry about. When we are all, most, we, I looked around our newsroom the other day. We've all gone to good colleges. We've gotten a great education. We live in Washington or New York or one of these great, amazing uh, centers of higher education on the, on the East Coast. Um, 
are we, in t are we really in touch with most Americans? Mm -hmm. And I don't want to repeat myself, but we've got to work at that. We've got to, we've got to bring journalists into the newsroom who come from uh, outside of Washington and New York. As I said, I was born in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I grew up as an army brat living all over the world. I lived in Missouri and New Jersey and back in Oklahoma and Georgia, Augusta, Georgia for a number of years. So I bring a little of that, but it was a long time ago. We need young people coming in from all parts of this country and internationally who can reflect the, the different backgrounds that they bring. In fact, it's something Gwen and I used to talk about all the time. We have to have a diversity of backgrounds in this newsroom or we're not doing our job. We're not reflecting this country. We have to do that and we have to guard against that elite mindset that only those folks who went to good colleges, you know, they have a reservoir and they know everything. And yes, they're smart and gosh knows they bring great ideas to what we do and we need to broaden it out. One of the things you and uh, Gwen broadened out was the talking heads on your show. Suddenly they look different, i.e. they weren't all just white male uh, elite. Uh, was that a conscious effort? How did you do that? We, it was a conscious effort. It is a conscious effort. It started under Jim Lehrer and even before that. As you may remember, the first uh, sidekick, if you will, for Jim Lehrer and Robert McNeil was Charlene Hunter Galt, who was a remarkable uh, still is. Hand. Still is. <laughs> remarkable pioneer of the civil rights movement, integrated the University of Georgia. She's still involved in the program. She still does uh, special reporting for us. And of course, Charlene was with the program for, I think, 15 mm. years and, and then with NPR. So Jim and Robin, from the very beginning, have had a commitment to women. They've had a commitment to diversity. Uh, I joined the program first in 1983. They wanted a Washington correspondent. I left NBC to come to the program because Jim and Robin told me specifically, we want a woman to have uh, an important role on the program. And, and when I was off wandering in the wilderness, as Jim used to say of cable television, uh, wait, where, wait, wait, wait. where we at one point together. Walter Isaacson was my boss as yeah. president of CNN. <laughs> um, he knows where all the bodies are buried. Um, <laughs> um, but at, at that point, when I was away from the news hour, was of course when Gwen came in, and it was because Jim wanted somebody, of course, with the amazing journalist that Gwen is, but it was the commitment to making that newsroom look more like the country. You've talked about a couple of mentors already, John Chancellor and now uh, Jim Lair. Tell me about the role of mentors uh, when you were a woman coming up in the business. Well, I would love to tell you that there were very many women mentors. The truth is there weren't any. <laughs> um, because I think, I think you heard the story. Um, from Dean Cohen a minute ago, when I uh, applied for a job as a, uh, uh, it was actually I was applying for a job as a secretary because they told me there were no jobs for reporters. Um, the answer was, uh, you know, we, I guess we'll hire you, but as you said, we already have a woman reporter. How could you possibly be interested? After I went to work as a reporter, one of the one of the uh, the men in the newsroom said, you know, it, you know, how could we possibly? We've already got one blonde reporter. Um, you know, why do we need anybody else here who wears skirts? I mean, it was just, it was this kind of open, um, uh, you know, attitude, if you will. But you know what? It didn't, <laughs> it never deterred me. My mother, I have to give credit to my amazing mother who passed away four years ago. She was not able, she not only didn't go to college, she couldn't finish high school. She barely fin was able to finish 10th grade. Her father passed away. She stayed home to take care of her siblings. And she always said to me, get your education, diapers and dishes can wait. Get your education, get your education. And so I, I carry that with me every single day. And, I, and when you ask who are my role models, my mother was a role model, even though she did from not. From Oklahoma? From, she was born in Missouri, grew up in Tulsa, Oklahoma. She is my principal role model. And beyond that, in this career, of course, as I, there, were, there were women. There was a woman named Cassie Mackin who covered oh. politics for NBC. But a who tragic went tale. out of her way, who, who died tragically at such a young age. She went out of her way to welcome me when I joined uh, NBC uh, after I'd been in local news in Atlanta. And there have been others along the way. Who well, there were, I mean, Pauline incredible. Frederick, Nancy Dickerson. Were Nancy together. Dickerson, Pauline Frederick. You've done your homework. No, no, I just, I'm old. Great. I remember them all. <laughs> 
Um, and then, of course, along the way, to be able to work with the greats, I mean, you can go down the list, the women of my generation, right. Leslie Stahl, uh, Connie yeah. Chung, Diane Sawyer, the women who came in about the same time I have. And today, look around, not just in television, but in print. Look at the, look at the people who are breaking news right now in the New York Times and the Washington Post. Karen Tumulty at the Washington Post. Uh, uh, Ashley Parker. I'm just, the, the names come. Don't forget Maggie Haberman. Uh, Boy, I'm she... saying at the New York Times, Maggie Haberman. These are reporters who are young and doing remarkable work at all these news organizations. They're making a difference. I have to say, Walter, though, we are not doing a good enough job with women in management of news. Not a single head. We're blessed at the news hour. Our executive producer is a woman, Sarah Just, who succeeded another woman, executive producer, I'm Linda about to Winslow. Say, yeah. Two phenomenal uh, journalists. Uh, the, the person who uh, runs the station that sponsors the news hour, Sharon Rockefeller, she's the president of WETA, our sponsoring station. So we have amazing women role models. And PBS. And PBS. Paula Kerger is the president of PBS. So we're, we're doing well. We don't take anything for granted. But I will tell you, as I look around the landscape, there's not a woman running a commercial broadcast network, news division, unless something changed in the last few minutes. Um, <laughs> There's not, it, look at the newspapers in this country. We don't have enough women editors. We need more Anne Marie Lipinskis. We need more Jill Abramsons. Uh, we need more Amanda Bennett's, the, the women who have run great newspapers, been newspaper editors. Uh, so we've come a long way, but we have to keep pushing. And, and, and it's, a, I mean, why do you think, Walter? I'm going to turn the tables on you. <laughs> Why, why don't we have more women bosses at these great news organizations? I mean, it's uh, endemic in our society. I worry about it even more in tech companies, in Silicon Valley, in, you know, innovation. And I think it's still a basic level of discrimination. I think people, there's, you know, one cut below taking them as seriously as you would a man saying, I mean, you have seen it and I have seen it now that I've tried to be attuned to it. Go around a table, people have different ideas, and yet all of a sudden the good idea gets attributed to a man who didn't actually say it. Right, right. So. And yet, and yet you, have, you have multiple women presidents of great universities, Drew Faust, Nan Cohan, who's sitting right here, who was president of Duke University, my alma mater. So we so, know there's a lot of female talent out there, uh, but, but it's a complicated So let me go back situation. to Gwen. Do you think that she felt more of an obstacle being a woman or being black? She told me, we had this conversation uh, on several occasions. I, I, I know from, I mean, it, I, I know that she felt being a person of color was harder. But it was the dual package that made it really hard for her. Um, Gwen didn't go around with a chip on her shoulder. She didn't go around complaining. That, that was not who she was. But she was informed and shaped by her own experiences. And that's what made her the remarkable, path-breaking, relentless, never-say-die journalist that she was, because she had been through what she went through at the Boston Herald, because she experienced so much of that on the campaign trail, following presidential candidates, senatorial, gubernatorial candidates, interviewing people, having people mistake her for something else, the maid in the hotel, rather than the person who was there to interview the candidate. She, she rose above all that. And we, we would joke about it. I mean, we, you know, she was a PK, she called it, a preacher's kid. I was an army bat, so we would talk about the experience. But, but there's no question that her experience growing up uh, in the life that she had, the obstacles she had overcome, helped to make her the pioneer, the, the extraordinary journalist that she was. It shaped her, and it made her more powerful as a presence. But, and, and we have to give her more credit as a result of that. There's, uh, she deserves. I speak of her in the present tense because, like I said, she's sitting right here. Um, 
she deserves much more credit because of what she and other journalists of color go through every day, people of color in this country go through every day still. Here we are, how many hundred and so many years past the Civil War and we're still fighting and dozen, decades past the Civil Rights Movement. We still have, are fighting these battles. We are still uh, on the front lines, if you will, and all of us have to come together to talk about it openly and to, and to confront it and to get ahead of it because if we don't, you know, we are, we are hurting the next generation and the generation after them. I, uh, <clears throat> I never heard her be bitter or complain. I mean, she was she always almost made light and up about it. But you were in a special bond with her. What did you all talk about when it got bad? <laughs> Well, I haven't even shared with you the really important link that we had. Um, I told this story at, at Gwen's service um, after she died, and that is that, you know, we came up, we realized that if it had been two guys sitting next to each other, you wouldn't have to worry about two guys, two suits, two mm -hmm. ties. But with women, we couldn't show up both wearing red, both wearing yellow. So we would email each other each night. <laughs> Wearing green, <laughs> wearing pink. <clears throat> but you know, after what we laughed about was after a few months of doing this, we just kind of intuited what the other one was gonna wear. We didn't even have to do the emails anymore. <laughs> we just knew it. There was one day when we sh both showed up in blue and you know, it was okay. Uh, <clears throat> but, but to get, you know, when the going got tough, we confided in each other. I mean, she, we, you know, we'd go, I'd go into her office, she would come into mine, they were right next to each other, and we would say, oh my gosh, what are we gonna do? Or, um, you know, we're gonna get through this together. It, you can't work Do you have an example? Well, I'm not gonna share this. Just with them. Yeah. <laughs> office politics. No, okay. uh, no, no, seriously. No, what I'll say is that what really matters in a team, whether you're a television anchor team or whether you're together running, I'm sure this is the case, running a business or running a university, is that the people at the top, the team, have to be able to trust each other. And we knew we had to trust each other, as I said a minute ago, have each other's backs, or we couldn't convey, we couldn't do our work and, and, and project it uh, for the audience. When you're sitting there on election night or at a debate, mm -hmm or at, some, at a convention, for example, as we did just last summer, the Republican and, National, and Democratic National Conventions, and, and it's spontaneous. You don't know what's gonna happen. You have to be able to trust, to know that if you say something uh, stupid, mm -hmm. <laughs> that the other person is gonna carefully, or sometimes not so carefully, <laughs> correct you. <laughs> Bring you back. But we had that kind of a relationship, and I give her almost all the credit for that because she was the generous human being that she was. Let me interrupt there, because I know how generous you've been to so many people. So I know you share that generosity, and it's important. Let me uh, end. And I do think that you all were the, are the two most intellectually honest people I know, but you both, with the spirit you had, were the two most generous people I know in the business. Uh, the traditional last question. I'm going to start to believe all this, or he's yeah. got to He's got to stop. It has the added virtue of being true. Um, the traditional last question is for this awardee is what advice would you give to a young person coming up in your field? We'll end with this. Jump in. We need more good, smart journalists today than we have ever needed. And if they come, if, and I, this happens all the time, they come up to me in our newsroom and as I move around Washington and other places, they come up and they say, should I really go into journalism? What's happening to journalism? And I say, look, I can't tell you where we're gonna be in 10 years. I can't even tell you where, where we're gonna be next year. But what I can tell you is that the American people are always gonna need reporters who are prepared to put themselves on the line, to go out there with an insatiable curiosity, find stories, find answers to tough questions, hold our public leaders accountable. We need, we need the next generation and the generation after that to do that. Jump in, the water's great. Uh, we need you. 
We've never needed you more than now. So if you have the curiosity, if you don't care what kind of hours you keep, if you can live on a little bit of sleep, um, and, you, and you love, I mean, journalism is the most, to me, I, I can't imagine doing anything other than journalism. I mean, what more interesting field can there be? You are constantly in contact with interesting people. So to what I say to young journalists is jump in, don't hesitate, get your good liberal arts education, mm -hmm. Uh, and then think about how you want to, how you want to, what part of journalism you want to work in. But there's always going to be a need in our democracy mm -hmm. for great reporting. President Faust in her <laughs> baccalaureate talked about the moral imperative of noticing, <laughs> and you have been an exemplar of that. Thank you, Judy. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to get this. Thank you so much. Bravo. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Walter and Judy, for this illuminating conversation. Anyone who watched Judy and Gwen could not help but notice the true friendship that they seem to share, and I think we got a very good look at that this afternoon. A gift for friendship was one of Gwen's many talents, so I would like to invite another of Gwen's closest friends to the podium. Please welcome journalist and author Michelle Norris, who will accept Gwen's Radcliffe Medal and share a few words. Now I will read the citation for Gwen's Radcliffe Medal. She raised tough questions, told hard truths, and held fiercely to fact. She illuminated the news to inform the public, strengthen civil society, and inspire future journalists. Thank you, Michelle Norris, for accepting Gwen Eiffel's Radcliffe Medal, given with our greatest admiration for her excellence in journalism. It is my great honor to accept this award for my dear friend. She so badly wanted to be here today. She um, was very humble, as you've heard, in taking her laurels, but she also enjoyed it. Uh, she had a special place in her home where she posted all of, all of her awards and her mini hoods, and she knew, in part, that when she was able to accept an award like this, she was able to shine her light in a special way so those who came behind her could see it. You've heard over and over and over again, mentoring was important to Gwen. Telling hard truths was important, but holding those truths up was important, but also holding her life up as an example was important. She would have loved that this happened here in Boston because her road to journalism began here in Boston. And Dean, you talked about the, the story, what happened in the newsroom, the horrible thing that was written at her desk. You saw the beginnings of who she became as a journalist and as a person and how she responded to that. She thought that that can't possibly be for me. And she just kept going. She would have loved that this was in an institution of learning because she felt so strongly that she wanted to spend time. And even when she was struggling with her illness, she still made, made time to be with mentors and to be with young people because she wanted them to follow her into the role of journalism. As a woman of color, I'm not gonna share her age. She would fuss at me um, for doing something like that at a podium. But as a woman of her generation, it meant that she was often the first. She rolled the mantle of being the first person, the first person to host a presidential debate as a woman of color, the first person to host a major political program. And that helps you understand as she, uh, who she was as a journalist. But I want to talk a little bit, if I can, in just a few moments about the first that she represented that, that also help us understand who she was as a human being. Yes, she was the first person to ask a tough question. She was the first person to see holes in a story. She was the first person to submit copy. She was a wicked fast writer. She was the first person often to spot trends or to push boundaries, boundaries and enforce, and enforce standards. But she was also the first person, as Judy mentioned, to help a young reporter. She was the first person to make herself available to someone new in the newsroom. 
She was the first and sometimes the only person to take the time to greet the security guards every day. She knew their names, she knew their birthdays, she knew when their kids were graduating from college. She was the first to sing happy birthday to the women who answered the phones at the Washington Post when we first worked together. I met Gwen at the Washington Post and it was almost 30 years ago, and for the past 30 years, we've lived about five blocks from each other. She was my best friend. She was the maid of honor in my wedding. She is godmother to my children, and I got to know her well. And so I also understood that she knew that if you exercise power in small ways, you could more easily claim the mantle in other ways. And so she was the first to call someone during tough times, the first to arrive to help lay out the hors d'oeuvres for a nervous host, because she could spot that. She was the first to understand and enforce the first rule of friendship, no competition. We remained friends even though we often competed with each other in the newsroom. Our career paths followed a similar trajectory. We met at the Washington Post. She went to NBC, I went to ABC, she went to PBS, I went to NPR. And Judy, you should know that we were informed by watching you and your years long and lovely and very strong friendship with Andrea Mitchell. We knew that we would be stronger if we held together and we decided not to compete against each other. She was the first, as one of our dear friends told us, to, to know what you needed before you knew what you needed. The first to say yes, to be by your side. Earther and cousin is in the audience and she for a number of years was the director of the World Food Program in Italy. And when, she, when Gwen figured that she was lonely, she was the first to say, you know what, I think you need someone by your side, even if it meant jumping the pond and going to visit her in Italy. She was the first, as Athalia Knight told me today, to tell, to tell us that it's gonna be okay, even when she wasn't even sure of it of herself, but she could help us understand that. She was okay with being the first, but she always wanted to make sure that she was not the last. So, she knew that she couldn't just bust down doors, but that she, she had to hold them open. You see, it's easier to bust down a door than to actually hold it open. You can muscle your way through a door, but if you hold the door open, it means that you have to stay at that door sometimes when other people, you can hear them in the distance having fun, moving on, doing other things. To hold the door open, you have to lift while you climb. You have to always be thinking of the people who are coming behind you. And so maybe we can think about that, particularly in a room full of so many accomplished women. What are we doing not just to open the door, but to hold the door open? Gwen used to talk about colored girl moments. We were brown girls raised in a country that didn't imagine these kinds of jobs for us. And on big days, she would call and she would say, I had a colored girl moment today. I interviewed Elton John. <laughs> I interviewed Colin Powell. This would have been a colored girl moment. She would have loved this moment. I'm wearing a very bright jacket today. My husband said that if I wore this, I would look like a walking highlighter. <laughs> But I share this because it reflects a colored girl moment for Gwen. You will remember her from hosting a series of vice presidential debates and not long ago with Judy, a presidential debate in Milwaukee with Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders. When she first did the first vice presidential debate with Dick Cheney and John Edwards, she was told by the, by the vice presidential committee that maybe she should wear a demur jacket because that's what the guys always do. They wore something dark, and it would make her look more authoritative, they said. I went shopping with Gwen when she decided <laughs> what she was gonna wear for that first debate. And if you remember her picture, and again, when she was portrayed by Queen Latifah, she also wore the same color jacket, and it was a very bright and resplendent blue. She was not gonna wear something dark. And you know why she decided? at least one reason why she decided to wear that bright colored jacket. She said, I wanna make sure the ancestors can see me. <laughs> and so when she hosted her second debate, she wore turquoise, doing that with a broken ankle as we remember. And when she did the debate in Milwaukee, she was resplendent in purple. She wanted the ancestors to see her, but she also wanted people who were coming behind her 
to see her as well. She's forever holding open doors even now through her legacy, which we uphold through our work and which Radcliffe up upholds with this award. I loved being her friend. I am only now getting used to saying that in the past tense. It will never feel right. I cherished being her colleague and I am so very honored to accept this award on her behalf. From the entire Eiffel family, thank you very, very much. And now, Judy, finally, the time has come to award your Radcliffe Medal. And I will now read the citation we've written for you. She exemplifies intelligence, integrity, and determination. She pursues truth with courage and conviction. She inspires us all to safeguard freedom of the press as an essential foundation of our democracy. Judy Woodruff, I bestow upon you, and if you would come forward, this Radcliffe Medal with the deepest admiration for a lifetime of excellence in journalism. Thank you. Oh, thank you. So special. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, thank you. And then this is your. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. And I'll give you the whole box. So you oh, good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very touched. Well, it's been quite a day. Thank you to, of course, to Judy and to Michelle and to Walter and to our wonderful panelists this morning for giving us an incredible experience. And I just want to thank all of you here in the audience for helping to make today's Radcliffe Day so special. So thank you for joining us for Radcliffe Day 2017.